our defense struggled for a couple seasons. While we were scoring a lot of points, they were giving up a lot of points. You know, there's no shortcut to playing this game. We had some tough games and tough times, and tough seasons. It was a team that didn't have a lot of superstars. We hired five head coaches. Each one had a lower winning percentage than his predecessor. Being the head coach and general manager of a team like the Packers carried a huge amount of stress. Gentlemen, this is the most important play we have. The play we must make, though. Cut! 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 Does it? Somebody coffee is coming home! Where it started! Players loved him. The players responded well to him. I think they thought that he'll get it turned around sooner or later. And uh, it, unfortunately, it, it didn't come about. Bart lived and learned on the job very tirelessly. It's the ultimate people business and a lot of different personalities and, and getting the best out of them. Toward the end of Bart's career, he learned to be a coach and he was a good coach. You'd go to the wall for Bart, that's for sure. With Bart Starr, it was about being the best that you can be, about respecting your teammates, about lifting everybody up. He would always say something to us that was, that was meaningful. Bart Starr is kind of two different eras, the early times and, and the later times. We had a pretty good offensive team. I mean, we weren't the best, but we were in the top five every year. I honestly thought he would be the answer to our dreams. The 1980s is a tumultuous time in the NFL. The players' union and owners clash over labor disputes in 1982 and 87. For the Packers, the decade is riddled with poor personnel decisions starting with the 1980 draft. We draft Bruce Clark out of Penn State with, I think, the fourth pick in the first round. He decides to go to Canada. Nobody goes to Canada. Bruce Clark spurns the team and signs with the Canadian Football League. Our biggest glaring need was a, a defensive lineman. Despite the preseason turmoil, the Packers score one of their most improbable victories in its season opener. September 17, 1980, Packers versus Bears at Lambeau Field. So we're coming up on the first uh, game, and, and, and I'm hurting for certain. I mean, I, I haven't played any real football in, in, in weeks. He had uh, a hernia operation prior to the season. He played the whole ball game. Yeah, yeah he's, he is what he is, Rock. And the darn thing goes to overtime. And uh, we finally get in position to kick a field goal. Chester Markle attempts a field goal for an overtime win. I snapped the ball, allowed too much penetration. Bears lineman Alan Page breaks through the line and blocks it. The football bounces off Page's helmet and ricochets back to Marco. Packers beat the Chicago Bears in overtime on opening day. Couldn't have been better. And I'll tell you what, I appreciated none of it. I was just so happy the damn thing was over. Said that he had read something years ago by Harry Truman that said it's not what you endure, it's how you endure what you're having to endure. And all of the injuries, the bad bounces, the lackadaisical play, the uh, some indifferences and so forth that, that have happened to us during the course of this preseason got evened up in one magnificent play this afternoon. So life has a way of evening things up, and I'm just delighted for our football team. Even though 1980 is another losing season, head coach Bart Starr never loses the respect of his players. He really cared about his players on and off the field. Bart was, uh, he was like a father-type figure coach to me, you know. Uh, very classy man. He was one of those guys that uh, you really wanted to play for hard for. You wanted to make him proud of you. You can't separate the human being from the coach. Uh, it, it, it's one and the same. Bart Starr has been the Packers head coach and general manager for six seasons. His record, 34 wins, 57 losses, and two ties. 
I just wonder how long they're going to keep uh, Bart Starr up there. There was a, a case of uh, the executive board hiring a hero instead of a coach. Now he's gotten to the point where he uh, knows a little football, but he still hasn't produced. And um, if Green Bay is satisfied with that, well, then they ought to keep him. But uh, I think it's about time that the Packers ought to be becoming uh, champions again. Two days after Christmas, during a contentious two-hour and 45-minute meeting, Packer board president Dominic Olenicek strips Star of his general manager title. Bart, as general manager, probably had the worst draft record of anybody in the history. It was terrible. The job of GM and head coach was too much for one person. It became apparent that we needed to have the separation of coach and, and general manager. Even Bart would be the first to tell you he wasn't ready for the, especially the dual roles of head coach and GM. Vince Lombardi couldn't handle it, yet the Packers gave those duties to Phil Bingston, Dan Devine, and Bart Starr. What did they expect other than failure? That was a lesson learned that you don't have one guy doing both jobs. It doesn't work. Olin Ejek keeps Starr on as head coach and allows him to continue to draft his own players. But the move leaves Starr stunned. As nice a man as I've ever met in my life. And if there was anyone you wanted to see succeed, it, it was Bart Starr. His inexperience just hurt him terribly. Bart Starr selects Cal quarterback Rich Campbell as the sixth overall pick in the 1981 draft. I don't ever remember a point where anybody said, did you see Campbell today? Man, he's going to be a player. I never remembered that day. Bob Schnelker, who was offensive coordinator under Bart, looked at Rich Campbell and realized he didn't have the arm required to be a top NFL quarterback. When you're picking that high, you got to hit those, and especially at that position. We could have taken Ronnie Lott, who would have been a great defensive back for us. Three games into the 1981 season, the Packers acquire holdout wide receiver John Jefferson from the San Diego Chargers giving up their first and second round picks for the next two years, as well as a veteran player. It took us a while to incorporate John Jefferson fully into our offense. People thought when he came, he's gonna be the same guy as Lofton. Lofton was that long striding deep guy, okay? John Jefferson was more of a knuckleballer. Different tools, different skills. John Jefferson, a three-time All-Pro receiver from San Diego, plays four seasons for the Packers and averages only 37 receptions. In less than 10 years since the John Hadle trade of 74, the Packers have traded four first round and four second round draft choices for two aging players. Their record reflects it, 52, 75, and two. Those mistakes that are made on draft day and through trades show up down the road. 1982, Dominic Olenicek's reign as president of the Green Bay Packers comes to an end. He serves as president of the Packers for 24 years, longer than anyone in team history. So it went from Mr. Olenicek, who had been a part-time president, to Judge Perrin's actually being here on a daily basis. No other owner in the NFL had a prefix judge. And, and when he first came in, I, I think Commissioner Rozell didn't know what he was getting. There was no doubt that we needed a full-time executive, and a good one. Judge Parents quickly earned the confidence of Commissioner Rozell because he was a clear thinker, he was a man of principle, but he was also a person who knew that you can't be overly rigid in your principles. He comes under a lot of criticism but I think he did some things that got this franchise moving in the right direction. And was one of the people who helped steer the league through some very difficult times from 1982 to 1989. The judge was uh, very eager to uh, check with the people on the executive committee and say, what are our needs? He realized that um, this team had to keep up with the Joneses. It resulted in a, the first really indoor uh, practice facility in the NFL. He was in there to enable people to think clearly, identify real alternatives as opposed to pipe dreams. 
and then pursue those alternatives in intelligent ways. In 1982, the threat of a strike looms as the Packers open their season at Milwaukee County Stadium against the Los Angeles Rams. Down 23-0 at halftime, the Packers rally for the biggest comeback in team history, a record held until 2013. Quarterback Lynn Dickey passes for 237 yards and three second-half touchdowns. The best quarterback that I played with was Lynn Dickey. He was just special. Lynn Dickey does not get the credit he deserves because he was a quarterback of very good offenses, but not ultra successful teams. Lynn was not gonna be bouncing around the pocket. And that was just a fact of life. The ultimate field general, he knows where everybody's supposed to be. He reads the defense <laughs> like there's no tomorrow. He throws a pretty ball. If we got criticized because we gave up a lot of sacks, so what? That was just the price you paid for having that quarterback that could spin a mean ball. There's a fine line between mental toughness and stupidity. I was in there somewhere. I don't know exactly where I fit in. Lynn Dickey held the single season record for the most yards passed for in team history when people didn't throw the ball a lot. I'd come in on Wednesday morning and get the game plan for that week. And uh, they, I'd look and there's like 10 new passes, no runs. But we never tried to run the ball that much. I told some, one guy, I said, look here, I said, Lynn Dickey can throw a football through an eye of a moving needle. Lynn Dickey put me, Paul Kaufman, and John Jefferson in the Pro Bowl. With uh, Lynn Dickey as a quarterback, and uh, with Lofton and John Jefferson, Paul Kaufman, they were fun to watch. We were pretty good. If you take one side of the football before the year starts and go, OK, this group's going to be in the top five, well, I'll take that. They were, uh, they were extremely uh, entertaining football team. Three days later, wage negotiations fail and a player strike halts the season for 57 days. It's frequently said you learn more from your mistakes and your failures than you do from your successes. So I think that was true in my case. That was true in Commissioner Rosell's case. As a result of a shortened season, the NFL conducts a 16-team Super Bowl tournament. Into the earliest 80s, Average, average. They make the playoffs in the strike season. The Packers make the first round of the playoffs with home field advantage. There's some encouragement there. And then all the air goes out of that balloon. January 8th, 1983. Nearly 1,000 tickets go unsold. For the first time since 1959, Lambeau Field is not a sellout. They couldn't draw people. It's hard to believe right now, but they had really almost become an afterthought for a lot of people in the community. In their first playoff victory since the Ice Bowl, the Packers beat the St. Louis Cardinals 41-16. We were a big player offense. We used to throw like a hundred different kinds of screens in addition to our deep passing game with James Lofton. It's the only playoff victory in Starr's career as head coach. We had every gadget in the book. I mean, we used to call it our Kmart offense. We could also ring the bell. We could light it up. Celebrating fans tear down the goalposts, continuing a tradition that started in the Lombardi era and ends with this win. The following week, January 16th, the Packers fall to Dallas in Texas, 37-26 in the second round of the tournament. I got a pick for a, a six in that game. Brung us back to about, I think, seven points down after that. Had a chance to win the game. And I wish we could have took it a little further than what we did, especially having Bart Starr as the coach. Think if we would have won the Super Bowl, with Bart Starr at head coach. How crazy would that would have been? The excitement and the hope of their postseason play, however, carries into 1983. We had some really good weapons with Paul Kaufman as my tight end. You want to see a try-hard guy make good? You're looking at a picture of Paul Kaufman. The greatest example I can think of of taking what God gave you 
talent-wise and maximizing it. We had another tight end named Gary Lewis, who was a 6'6 guy that, you know, caught the ball pretty well. Gary Ellis and Eddie Lee Ivory, both of those guys caught the ball fantastic. We had some good players. We had some great players. We had James Lofton. He was the complete package. He is so far superior to the rest of us mortals. He catch a ball over the middle and get the heck smacked at him. He still get up and keep going. James Lofton was as gifted a receiver as the Packers have ever had. He was a prolific <laughs> wide receiver. If he got one step on you, it's over. You're not gonna catch him. As one season was progressing, I had caught like 68 passes late in the year, and somebody asked me, "Are you excited? You're close to breaking Don Hudson's record." I didn't want to break Don Hudson's record. I thought that his record should stand there forever. We also had a little guy named Phil Epps. Phil could absolutely fly. He might have been the only guy who could outrun James Lofton. We had big time offense. However, we could not stop anybody. We were that bad. October 17th, 1983, Monday Night Football. Bart had an overhead projector for the very first team meeting. And he puts this view graph up in, on the projector, and it's, a, and it's a, a quote from one of the Washington players. This game is going to be a rout. The Redskins were the defending Super Bowl champions. Bob Snelker's nickname was Sneaky. He called him Sneaky Snelker. And it wasn't like he snuck up on you, because he was really in your face. The assistant offensive line coach comes out to me, says, hang on to your hat tonight. And I said, what's the deal? He said, Sneaky is unloading the playbook. He says, the hell with the defense, they can take care of themselves. We are going for the throat. Everything we got, we're laying out on the Redskins. Back then, there weren't a lot of night games. It was Monday night games were a big deal. Before the game, Bart put that same view graft up in the locker room. I thought, okay, uh, we got it, you know, uh, enough. He says, once again, I'll just tell you, this guy says, this game is going to be a rout. And then Bart turns to every guy and he goes, but he didn't say which way. And we all went, whoa, that was pretty cool. He goes, let's go kick their ass. I remember the crowd was so into the game. It was just, an, it was a great atmosphere. And the stands were electric that night. As a lineman, you're never doing it for the roar of the crowd because the crowd isn't roaring for you. You're doing it for the guys next to you. The game was like a ping pong match, back and forth. It was not a good night to be a defensive back. Bob Schnucker kind of shoves me a little bit and he goes, just keep at it. You know, um, they can't stop us. I said, yeah, we can't stop them either. True to form, we're ringing up 48 points. And defensively, true to form, we're allowing 47. Monday Night Miracle. This was really something special. Do a fake field goal and you can walk in. Gary Lewis goes up. The game is a microcosm of what's ahead. The Packers score 30 or more points six times that season. But they rank dead last in the league on defense. December 18th, the season ends at Soldier Field with a classic showdown of the oldest rivalry in the NFL. Bob and Jack Knoll were the equipment guys. Bob comes in and says, boys, I got good news and got bad news. Well, the bad news is it's five below here in Chicago. The wind chill's almost 60 below. Well, the good news is we're not playing up in Green Bay because it's minus 12 and minus 70 up there. <laughs> A heartbreaking 23-21 loss to the Bears dashes all hope of a repeat playoff appearance. What our weakness was in that 83 team, we did not have a defense. We gave up a lot of points uh, throughout that year. Packers president, Judge Perrins, makes the tough call. The next morning I'm at my desk and Judge Perrins walks by my office and just says good morning and kept going. 15 minutes later he comes back by and he says, well, it's done. I said, what's that? I just fired Bart and his assistant coaches. Fired Bart like that. Interesting coming from a person who knew nothing about football. Judge Barron's 
probably a good person, a good business guy, but he knew nothing about football. You have to remember, uh, we're talking about Bart Starr, the organization that he led to greatness, to the glory years, the organization fired him. How, how do you fire Bart Starr? It's like firing Santa Claus. It sent shockwaves through the community. It's almost like your mom and dad firing you from the family. Think about it, it is Bart Starr. And he's unceremoniously fired from the Green Bay Packers. We, we'd waited long enough, it had to be done. Bart did have nine years. He was probably becoming better as a coach, but he needed help. If you had given him a few more years as an assistant coach or assistant head coach somewhere else before bringing him back to Green Bay, well, he, might, he might have had a successful career. One of the players told me at one point, playing for Bart was like playing for the President of the United States. He surrounded himself with people that were good at the things he wasn't so good at. He was coaching his best when they let him go. Bob Schnelker told me that he thinks that he was becoming an excellent football coach later in his, in his tenure. He was, he was really coming into his own. Nine years, one playoff appearance. He beat only 13 teams that had a winning record. The football leadership we had in the building, it just was not strong enough to, to, to compete with the other teams. As they got stronger, we got weaker. One of the worst experiences of my professional career was after they let Bart Starr go, and I see his car pulled up to the loading dock outside the old locker room, and he's loading stuff into the back of his car. And I'm thinking, that's Bart Starr. How can this be? As a player, it makes you feel uh, responsible, accountable. You contributed to this moment. And, uh, you know, what's that say about you? Maybe you fell short. Nineteen eighty four, another former Lombardi era Packers player turned coach takes the head coaching reins. Hall of Famer Forrest Gregg. The powers that be, here's their conventional wisdom. Bart was not tough enough. We need a guy in here that's gonna toughen these guys up. If you bring in Forrest Gregg, who had the tie to the Packers, you had a proven head coach. It appeared he was the answer at the time because he had success with Cincinnati and Cleveland. Gregg had a tough time of it in Cleveland, but everybody thought that there had been some interference on the part of others in the organization that had under undermined him. When it was announced that, that uh, they hired Forrest, I got a call from Ken Anderson um, a few weeks later. Ken Anderson was quarterback with the Cincinnati Bengals where Forrest had been. So he said, have you met Forrest yet? I went, no. Yeah, give me a call back. Let me know how, how it went. I said, is there something I should know? No, no, just let me know what you think. The players didn't care for Forrest Gregg. They didn't like his manners and the, and the way he treated them. We have this mini camp. Front row is Larry McCarron, leader of the football team. Our center, tough as nails. And a good team man, good team man. Not 30 seconds into Forrest's first speech, and it was all about money. Guys are making too much money like you, McCarron. You make way too much money for what you do. And I went, oh, wow. I think there was a method to Forest Madness. Doing something like that. Now, did I resent it? Yes. Did I like it? No. Did I hate his guts at the moment? Yes. The 84 season is off to an ugly start. We start out the first half of that year, one and seven. 
I hold a little meeting because I was the oldest guy on the team. People felt that with SAR they were on the cusp of having some success and that maybe Forrest could get him over the top. He was swimming upstream at that time. I said, let's play for us. He wanted us to play for him only. I said, no, this is, this is an us game, not a you game. And we went out that second half and went seven and one. We did it for us though. They go eight and eight in 84 and are on the verge of repeating the same standing going into the final game of 85. The snowball game had this tremendous amount of snowfall began the night before and into that morning. A howling blizzard, over 10 inches of blowing, drifting snow. There's some uncertainty whether or not it would be played. The city is shut down. The game against the Buccaneers is not. That was the first time I didn't see the stadium sold out because everybody couldn't get here. There were a bunch of us kids in the neighborhood that piled into the car, and I swear we got stuck no less than six times on the way over, and we would get out, push the car out of wherever we were stuck, if it was a snow drift or a pile of snow. I knew it psyched out the uh, Tampa Bay fans and the players. Many people arrived via snowmobile, so the parking lot was uh, dotted with snowmobiles. A few of us walked outside to test out the field. We knew it was all snowy, but we went out there with just t-shirts on, running around the field like it wasn't no big deal. There were times during the game where the wind would blow, and of course the snow's uh, going at the same time. You could not see the other end of the stadium. The stands were kind of a mess, so you had to kind of clear out an area where you're gonna sit. The Packers plow through the Buccaneers 21 to nothing. Four of the last eight games in 85 are won by 24 points or more with a consistently dominant offense. But Coach Greg is hard on his players and makes hardline changes. Because they had stripped Starr of his GM title in 1980, Greg was not given the title of GM either. Yet they both essentially had the authority to pick their roster draft their own players and hire their own coaches. When Forrest came in, there was a core of pretty good players there. What he wanted to do is bring his own players in. He brought most of his own coaches in. As he goes along, he's not too enamored with that core. What he really wanted to do was get rid of all, all of the players that Bart left behind. He was convinced that if you're one of Bart's guys, you would never be one of his guys. He gutted the roster in the 86 season and got rid of a lot of his veterans. The thrill and the fun I had of playing the game that I just loved, it was gone. The Packers averaged nearly 5,500 no-shows for their eight games in Green Bay and Milwaukee. The joke was in the late 80s that uh, I left two tickets on the dashboard of my car at the mall, and when I got back, there were four more. This kind of tells you how the Packers were viewed during the 70s and 80s. They couldn't draw people. Green Bay was kind of viewed as the Siberia of the NFL. Somebody would make a bad play, uh, he'd say, you know, if you don't straighten up, we're going to ship you off to Green Bay. Green Bay Packer football was part of the fabric of life, not only in Green Bay, but the entire state of Wisconsin, and in many cases beyond. We always try to give it our all. Honestly, I can't think of anybody who'd want to go out there for three hours and get the head smashed in without wanting to win. They were a very, very average football team, but I didn't necessarily see it that way, I, you know, it was always like stardom to me. Green Bay Packer football, and this is during the crummy times, it was still a privilege. It's the first thing about football that I can ever remember. I was a huge fan. They were always not making the playoffs, eight and eight, maybe seven and nine. I was still a fan of the guys. 
Low ticket sales and turnout show fan interest is diminishing. Their tolerance is tested. Losing generates impatience pretty quickly. My mom would always say, if it upsets you so much, why don't you turn it off? There was some really miserable football. The losing continued with Greg. And there was no character tests for players that he brought in and added to the roster. That's when a lot of the off the field problems started. There was no question the Green Bay Packers were not that uh, first class franchise. 1986. An abysmal 1-9 start includes a Packers loss to the Bears on November 23rd, 12-10, with a controversial Packers play during the game on Bears quarterback Jim McMahon. There's some kind of bad blood along the, on the, along the lines of uh, uh, playing the uh, Chicago Bears. Boys, Greg had a temper. Didn't get him anywhere in Green Bay. The um, confrontations we had with the Bears, he and Ditka did not like each other. It was a uh, kind of love-hate thing and some, um, some nasty things that went on as far as uh, uh, hitting after the whistle. Charles Martin slammed Jim McMahon to the turf in Chicago and injured a Super Bowl champion. With four games remaining in the season, NFL Commissioner Pete Rozelle suspends Charles Martin for two games. I thought at the time how low have we sunk? There are more than 9,000 empty seats for the final home game of the 1986 season. The Packers fall to the Vikings 32-6. They go winless in Green Bay for the first time since the stadium was dedicated in 1957. I was embarrassed for the Green Bay Packers. In the early 1980s, there were the sports atmosphere in Wisconsin, the Brewers were good. The Bucks were good. The Packers were an afterthought. Ugly court cases bring more unwanted national attention to the team. Things got out of hand under Greg, especially off the field, with the off the field incidents. What the player can do on the field has to be balanced with who the player is off the field. And unfortunately, we got away from kind of paying attention and, and doing that balancing act. We certainly had some, some issues with some players uh, during that stretch. The May 25th, 1987 issue of Sports Illustrated examines the Packers' 20-year drought since the Lombardi era and brings to light prejudices African-American players experience while in Green Bay. The story was written by a respected journalist, Frank DeFord, maybe the preeminent sports writer of the time, saying, hey, time has passed for Green Bay. If Green Bay can't win in these current eras, should the Packers move to Milwaukee, to a bigger city that would be more attractive, maybe to more of the players? The fans here were really turned off by what SI referred to as troubled times in Titletown. Forrest Gregg and his Packers forge ahead on the field. In the front office, a new position is created, the first ever executive vice president of football operations. Judge Robert Perrins was the head of the organization. He was looking for a football person to come in and help the head coach. We had gone through years where the head coach had been the coach and general manager both. Judge had some good ideas. He did some good things. So we split the duties, just didn't go far enough. One of the candidates who came in in 1987 was Ron Wolf. Then the very next day, he withdrew his name from consideration. I've always felt the problem was he knew he wouldn't get total authority here, that he was going to have to share it with the head coach. So eventually, Tom Bratz was hired for that position, and it was a 50-50 situation. The 1987 NFL Draft. In Bronx's first for the Packers, they pick quarterback Don Makowski from the University of Virginia in the 10th round. The Packers sort of teased a return to greatness in the late 80s after they drafted Don Makowski. Being a 10th round draft pick, I had a very, very big chip in my shoulder, knowing that I was much better than the 10th round draft pick. When Don Makowski became the Packers quarterback, that was pretty exciting. He was a young guy, had long hair, frosted hair, popular with everybody. 
he starts five games his rookie season. I had a lot to prove when I came to Green Bay. He had a, a collection of young, exciting talent around him. Obviously, with the, with the history that this team has, it was, a, it was an incredible team to be, be drafted by. After years of bad teams and average teams, just having hope was a great thing. We tied Denver in the first game I started. We beat Detroit. And then we went on NFL strike that year, so we missed four, four ball games. In a season that begins using replacement players, the Packers finish with only five wins. It's very difficult for any rookie to play, and missing four weeks set me back a little bit. Head coach Forrest Gregg is under fire. His four-year record, 25, 37, and one. He announces his resignation in January 1988. They tried to regain their, their success on the field by bringing back all-time greats. It frankly did not work. Forrest Gregg made one huge mistake. He believed that uh, they had the offense. All he had to do was make the defense better get a tough, hard-nosed defensive coach. One of Forrest's problems was he didn't recognize the good guys, the guys who cared. He miscalculated the situation. The Packers were not on the cusp of anything. The Packers conduct a three-week search for a new head coach. After interviewing 17 candidates, they offer the job to Michigan State coach George Perlis, but he backs out at the last moment. Ultimately, Lindy Infante, the offensive coordinator of the Cleveland Browns, is named the Packers' new head coach, their third head coach in six seasons. A very cerebral, cerebral guy, and he was not only the head coach, but he was also our offensive coordinator, and he was also the quarterback coach, so I spent every day, all day with him. He didn't love pass protection. I don't think he gave a darn about it. Lindy was an old-school coach that believed in discipline, and doing things the right way. And it's his rules, that's it. What he loved was getting as many people out on pass routes and uh, pick plays and combination routes, and getting as many people out there as possible. He wanted me to become more of a cerebral quarterback. He didn't realize if your quarterback is horizontal, none of it does you any good anyway. Markowski starts nine games in 1988. I was a young guy, very athletic quarterback, was making a lot of plays, scrambling, was making a lot of plays running. Coach Infante wants to see a change in Mikowski. After my second year, he said, look, it's time for you to become more of a manipulator than a gunslinger. I don't know if anybody was thinking like, hey, this is, we found the answer at quarterback. The season ends at four and 12. Sitting dead last in the NFC Central Division, the Packers get the second overall pick in the 1989 NFL Draft. They select offensive tackle Tony Mandrich from Michigan State. As things turn out, he was a bust. Some people call him the greatest bust of all time. Cowboys got the first pick, took Aikman, and then uh, we're sitting there looking at Tony Mandrich. There were tremendous expectations for him. He was consensus, all-American pick. He was a bright young man, friendly. Nice to be around. Those steroids just tore him up. He was saddled with the fact that he was that guy that was supposed to be a game changer at a non-game changing position. We could have also taken Barry Sanders in that draft. Mandrich plays just three seasons with the Packers. I do give Tony credit for working his way back into the league. But he was never the player that he was supposed to be. Everybody in the world thought Tony was the next big thing. From the incredible bulk to the incredible bust, here he went down with the Colts and made a career for himself. 1989, quarterback Don Makowski, aptly referred to as the Magic Man, re-energizes the Packers fan base. Lindy gave him the starting job at the beginning of training camp, and, and he said, this is your job, this is your team. The year before, we only won four games. I was now the starting quarterback for the Green Bay Packers, and I was ready to go. Finally, I was the guy. November 5th, 1989, 
The Packers have four wins and four losses as they take on their chief rival, the Chicago Bears, in sold out Lambeau Field. We came out really fast and in our first drive, we took the lead seven nothing. Throughout the course of the game, the Bears took the lead um, and were up six points going all the way into the fourth quarter. I had led the team all the way down the field to try to take the scoring lead. Bears linebacker John Roper causes Makowski to fumble on first down with a blitzing leap. I came to the sideline really discouraged and there was a couple of minutes left and Lindy Infante grabbed me by the face mask and he said, keep your damn head up because you're still gonna be the hero of this game. After the Packers get the ball back, on a fourth and desperate situation, Makowski finds Sterling Sharp in the end zone. The touchdown celebration is interrupted by a line judge's yellow flag. That was the first year they had instant replay, so they reviewed it for four minutes. It was the famous words that after further review, we have a reversal, touchdown. The place went crazy. We kicked the extra point and we beat the Chicago Bears. The final score, 14-13. The ruling is so controversial led the NFL to abandon instant replay for seven years. Finally at home, after eight games, we hadn't beaten them. It was a special moment. It was a special moment. Special game. Makowski leads Green Bay to a 10 and six record. Their best in 27 seasons. In 1989, when they won 10 games, Magic Man Don Makowski in the instant replay game against the Bears, they didn't make the playoffs. People don't realize that. Don Mikowski had a marvelous year and we had a winning record. It looked like we might be on our way. He had a magical year in 89. He's kind of the, uh, the trigger man for a season's worth of success and, and, and did a lot of good things. He becomes the first Packers quarterback selected to the Pro Bowl since Bart Starr in 1966. If you would ask me at the beginning of the season, I'm going to lead the league that year in passing and be, and be an All-Pro, I would have said that would have been a tall order. Joining Makowski as a Pro Bowl selection, second-year wide receiver Sterling Sharp, an honor he'll repeat four times in the next five years. With 1,423 receiving yards and 12 touchdowns, he averages almost 90 yards a game for the season. We really swung it around in 89. Won four games that year by one point. We were so happy to have a 10 and six record. It was uh, unfortunately not long lasting success. That was all we had to hang our head on for quite some time. The 80s were not kind to the Packers. Three head coaches, just one playoff appearance for the decade and a record of 65, 84 and three. I used to go to Super Bowls and see these big helmets blown up on the field before the game. And I have to admit, I used to wonder, I wonder if I'm ever gonna see a Green Bay helmet down there. I had that player mentality. Every week, ignorant, don't confuse me with the facts. Every week, we got a chance. But change is coming. In the summer of 1989, Bob Harlan is unanimously named the new president and CEO of the Green Bay Packers. At 52, he becomes the team's eighth president, the first who is not a local. Well, all the previous presidents had been prominent local businessmen or professional people. That's one of those old school things that I think actually mattered at one time. A native of Des Moines, Iowa, Harlan has been a member of the Packers front office since 1971. Bob Harlan was a native, although he was more qualified than any native out there. His appointment signals big changes for the franchise. I think that move was the single greatest move in the revival of this franchise. When you look at Packers history, recent history, Bob Harlan is the turning point. He came in with Dan Devine and that, era, that, that regime back in the early 70s. He knew the organization inside and out. Bob Harlan was much more of a, a fan-friendly business person, had great PR skills. 
he just took it to a different level than what, what it had been under, under Judge Perens or Mr. Olenicek. As a leader, he was, he was a great communicator and he was extremely positive. Leadership through service, he was always very much like, you know, what can I do to help you? He becomes the Moses to lead the Packers back to the promised land. How can you accept being mediocre? Year after year after year, you, we, we had to get better. He changed the complexion of the whole organization. We needed to find a way to bring winning back here, to recapture what we had in the 60s with Vince Lombardi. This is Green Bay. This is Tidal Town. And this is something that's inherent in our blood that we win championships. When I was leaving LA, I'm kind of glad I did get cut because I was checking out the, the uh, rental prices and see what the apartments are going to cost. So I found me an efficiency apartment, you know, and he was one of $900 a month. So I did a little calculate. I'm thinking, by the time I sent mom a little money home, by the time I paid the rent and had me a little fun, I'm going to need a loan just to get back home in the summer. Green Bay called. My agent says, uh, would you like to play in Green Bay? I'm like, okay, where's Green Bay? Um, so he says, well, it's in Wisconsin. I said, okay, uh, well, let's go. I need a job. When I fly out of, out of LA, you know, LAX, and you fly over the city, and I look down, Nothing but lights. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm leaving this. <laughs> Coming out of Milwaukee, I'm looking down like, what the? Where we at? And I'm trying to figure out what the, what? I said, what's all that stuff down there? I said, that's farmland. I'm like, oh, no. 